As I said, in this case, the idea is that you reduce the black scale from fitting somewhere here to down to close to the EU scale essentially. That's a basic idea that we want to introduce some extra dimension so that your effective black scale comes down from say 10% 18 G all the way to around P. So you don't really have uh, uh, what do you call uh, a hierarchy problem because now you have produced the large hierarchy between the forces. So the gravitational force is much much becomes stronger at uh, quantum gravity scale is very close to the EU scale. So there is no large hierarchy in the between the forces. The forces are all uh, very close to each other. So just again to recap, so G. Uh, so if we have a force, gravitational force, given by G, M1, M2 by R square. So this is essentially like, uh, in terms of uh, field, this is what I wrote yesterday, last time, essentially, last cap. Now, to estimate, now what happens is if you have more and more dimensions, the R keeps increasing. If you have infinite dimensions, say for example, the uh, dependence on R keeps increasing. The dependence on R keeps increasing. But if you have compact dimensions, if you have infinite dimensions, you keep saying, okay, infinite dimensions, it's uh, the so and so and everything. You can see in the force law the difference essentially. But if you keep increasing, uh, but if you want to have compact dimensions, what is important is the, the amount of volume or uh, the volume factor comes into the picture essentially. So it's better to use the Gauss law. Okay. So last time we had this argument that why you are not using the force law essentially. Because if you want the volume factor. So, okay. You want the volume factor because you are, uh, we want to see, it is not infinite extra dimensions. Infinite extra dimensions are ruled out. You cannot have any change uh, in, say, sun earth distance or anything. Okay, so there are strong constraints on if you have something like this, any deviation, any deviation from the inverse square law, you have very strong constraints. Okay, so any deviations in four dimensions, if so for the inverse square law, you have a lot of, a lot of the constraints. Okay, the simplest thing is essentially you measure your. Uh, say for example, uh, in astrophysics is very normally used. There also they use a lot of Gauss law. So what they do is essentially, uh, so you, you use a Green's theorem essentially. Uh, so you have the gravitational field and this you convert into, this is a surface medium. Okay? This is a Gauss law essentially. This you convert into a volume integral with the amount of, uh, if there is a gravitational matter inside some field, say for example. So if, you're, if you want to measure gravitational field around, what is the gravitational field around sun or any planet or anything, what you do is essentially you take some of all the sources, derive its potential, and you just check what is at the surface, what is the gravitational field. So this is given by the uh, by the, uh, uh, what do you call, the gravitational potential on the surface, this is given by the surface integral of the sun. And this is given by the total density inside, encompassed inside the, inside the volume. The, this is density of the mass, assuming they are all uniform and so on. So, so if you have something like a, say, um, some planet or something, some or all the mass, small, small parts of the smaller planet, but it's a continuous mass term, so you just take the shape. Now, this volume will also, you can take various shapes now. Okay? So, suppose if it's a cylinder, what happens? Suppose, suppose if it is a, uh, uh, I don't know, toroid, <laughs> okay? So, what is its shape? So, what? how do you measure its gravitational pull, essentially? So, how does the gravitational pull change, essentially, at a distance? 
So at every distance you can build a shell around it and measure it. But once you have, now you want to use the same technique. You want to use the same technique what astronomers use to measure the gravitational field around the planet or a bunch of gra any gravitational system. Okay? Okay? Say, uh, I don't know, meaning if you want to uh, measure some galaxy or uh, so when you are doing dark matter, you use the same thing. For the uh, uh, suppose when you are doing the rotational curves, you use the same formula. You exactly use the same formula, inverse square formula, actually when you are doing the rotational curves and everything. Okay. So the same technique. Now what you want to do is, but instead of taking, so this tells you that an amount of mass enclosed inside it. Given volume will tell you what is the field, the surface density of uh, uh, field at a particular surface at a distance r. That's what it tells you essentially, the gravitational field. Now you can check the field at various distances, and that's how you write down what is the total mass inside. Okay, uh, is proportional to the total mass inside enclosed inside that particular space. This is the same thing you use for dark matter. Actually, I remember just. That, that you use the same thing for dark matter essentially. You divide it into shells, okay? You divide it into shells, assume that the dark matter density is the same, and then you do the e power minus r square shells, okay? And you have some more all the shells essentially. Okay, you do the same thing. Now the point is that, uh, now if you have extra dimensions, if they are infinite, you don't have it. You have n is equal to say 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 1, n is equal to 1 means in five dimensions, and is equal to two is fifth dimension. It will modify the inverse square law essentially. But if it is compact, the constraints are very strong if they are infinite extra dimensions. But if it is compact, you can modify by a volume factor. That's what we are trying to do essentially. By a volume factor, the gravitation, uh, <coughs> the Newton's gravitation. You modify the gravitation. Capital G, essentially the Planck mass. We are modifying the capital G. Now you can. Um, so the basic idea is that you write a potential. Okay. And this potential or whatever it is solves the uh, Poisson equation. Okay. The potential solves the Poisson. This phi, or sometimes in elementary books it's written as u, or if you want it written in the one standard classical mechanics books, it's written as u. So we can express it as the Poisson equation. So this is what we did. So last time. So uh, I wanted to write the plan. So if you do this for the gravitational potential in uh, four dimensions, say for example, now if you want to write the Poisson's equation in four dimensions. Four plus n dimension, so this is q small. Crucial point is because the field is changing, the field is changing, G also should change its units. The point is that G's units also are changing. So G's units in four dimensions and G's units in five dimensions are different. 
especially if you put h cross is equal to c is equal to 1, okay, so these units will also change because they become higher, uh, meaning, uh, so it's better to write it in terms of Planck units. So you can see that the Planck mass changes essentially in higher dimensions. It peaks pick, picking up essentially. So you're increasing by one mass unit, the Planck mass. Okay, Planck mass is nothing but GM. One by H bar C is the right? H bar C are same. Higher dimensions as well. G depends on one by Planck mass square. Right. Changes. Everything changes actually in, higher, in fact in higher dimensions. As you see, uh, the dimension of a scalar field changes. In four dimensions, the dimension of a scalar field is one. In five dimensions, it's three by two. Or actually depends upon okay, it, it becomes two essentially. So the dimensions we can count because the action which sits in front essentially is not d for four x, it's d for five x. But that, uh, yeah, so that's the reason why you have everything changes essentially. The dimension will be changed by one unit length. One unit length for each extra dimension. Mm -hmm. So this uh, del square assume, so it's uniform distribution for matter. So and then you have the del square n plus 3 uh, n 4 plus n actually it's 3 plus n I wrote it as 4 plus n is del square by del r square plus n minus 1 by r del by del r so it is just n is equal to 0, this is 1 by n del by del r, essentially n is equal to 2, n is equal to 2, is equal to 1. So if you want a solution for this u, this is nothing but n plus 4, g n plus 4, m R cap n plus 1. So it increases by each extra dimension, this one increases. But the problem is this satisfies this equation. This satisfies this equation. Okay, this is just nothing but integrating this out. Assuming uh, volume factor only, I am just writing some. Okay, there is nothing different. There is nothing, there is no major thing in this equation. Okay. Um, now the point is that you know that for the Poisson's equation it's always 1 by r essentially. So you know the solution. Now the point is that this is not for compact dimensions. Because in compact dimensions, what happens? Any extra dimension y goes back to itself. Okay? Goes back to itself. Uh, yeah. It should work for n equal to equal to n. is equal to, it should go back to? It should go back to equal to n. Yeah, it should go back to, there is some, for, oh, okay. No, this is, okay. Uh, now I think I made a mistake here. This should be uh, n minus, uh, no, it should not become n minus, it should become 0 actually. This is 4 minus 4 Laplacian. Oh, the Laplacian is for n plus 3 actually. 3 dimensional. So n minus 1. This is in 4. Ah, this is fine, I think. Minus 1. n is equal to 0, you will get correct here. Yeah, 1 by r dr is fine now. So only there is uh, minus 1 by r dr. Right. No, because if you write it in terms of spherical polar coordinates. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You're right. Spherical polar coordinates and angulars don't matter. Those angulars are essentially 4 pi. Okay? 
and then the only thing which matters is essentially 1 by r square term the del square in 1 by r square term now this is fine right No, the basic idea, okay, when I said assume uniform matter, I mean it doesn't have some angular uh, dependence essentially. So it's all sort of enclosed in certain things. So it would have some angular concept. Otherwise, there will be an angular concept. Yeah. So if you want this, you can assume anything you want. Okay. Uh, meaning you can assume some complicated uh, geometries you want and then try to uh, derive the equation essentially out of it. Okay. And try to find a solution for it. For each kind of compact geometry you have, you'll have a different solution for the uh, for the uh, Newton's law. If you want. So the modification from the Newton's law would be modified for each kind of geometry you assume for um, the Newton's law. Uh, the geometry you assume for the compact application. So if you assume a simple circle, say for example, y is equal to the simple circle compact application, you know, you have a radial distance as so. so suppose if you have y is equal to y plus 2 pi r. So the compactification is y is equal to y plus 2 pi r y is equal to y plus 2 pi r. So, you take a line, an infinite line and then say this point y is equal to 0 is the same as y at every 2 pi r distance essentially. So, this point is the same at a distance of 2 pi r. So, this is equivalent to writing it in terms of a circle of a distance with the radius r. So you can define an angle theta and this theta is roughly equal to y by r. Should be dimensionless essentially. Is equivalent to y by r. As y goes to 0, theta goes to 0. As y goes to 2 pi r, theta goes to 2 pi r. Theta goes to 2 pi r. So you can just replace this extra angle, uh, extra uh, dimension in terms of just an angular variable which is dimensionless with the given distance r. r is the freedom we have. r is the freedom we have. This is the simplest compactification we can think of. This is the simplest compactification we can think of. Now you can think of more complicated compactifications like for example <coughs> instead of a circle you put a toroid, you can put uh, Mobius strips, you can put all kinds of things essentially. Okay, then the formula will change. The formula will change according to that. Now, then for each case, you have to use the Gauss law, and when you are doing the surface integral, you have to use the shape essentially. So, for example, now here you are just assuming dx dy. Okay. Uh, you are assuming dx dy and then you are assuming dr square essentially dr essentially dx dr essentially dr sin theta essentially okay. you can just take spherical polar coordinates and whatever the order of things essentially okay now if you have more complex com complicated geometries compactification this area integral will get modified essentially this area integral will get modified accordingly and you put limits accordingly the dx limits will change, the dy limits will change, and so on. So, the simplest compactification we choose is this. So, accordingly, this formula is not correct. It is only for infinite dimensions. So, then this formula will get changed to
B or U? We use B. Now I wrote this formula for various reasons. So this tells you the potential at a distance x in four dimensions, at a distance y, at a distance y in the fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth dimensions. Okay, so distance y. <coughs> now m i are some integers, integers essentially. M i are some integers. We will come to this why these integers come a little bit later. Uh, we will see why these integers come. Because you are choosing in the extra dimension a point. Okay? And the number of points you can choose are large. Okay? Now this will not matter. This will not matter if r is very, very smaller than y essentially. Okay? So you can take limits essentially whether r, r is very very larger than y or r is r, r, r is much much larger than y. So suppose if we have 2 pi r m is any point you can choose on this circle. m is any point you can choose on the circle and you can keep going around You can keep going around. Okay, you have multiple choices of this integers, essentially multiple points. Okay, you can choose a lattice or it is any random point on this circle from which you are measuring your potential. From which you are measuring your potential. You can define your what is the potential here, what is the potential here, what is the potential. Now if y is very far from r, is y is very, very far from r, this point will not make a difference, it doesn't say this distance. So y is much much larger than r, you can just replace it with the volume factor which we have seen. We have to. So it cannot resolve the, if you want to resolve the extra dimension compactification, okay, you are sitting very close to the extra dimension. So for example, if we, we saw that, if we, we wrote the formula for the M plan, right? Uh, where did we write? Okay. Yeah, something like this. Actually, this is the formula I wrote. No, this formula tells you that you are very far from y, then only the volume factor comes in. y is much much larger than r. So essentially the volume factor comes in. Now if you are very close to y, that means you are measuring uh, gravitational potential very close to y, uh, the r essentially, you are dissolving the r. That means you are sitting at 1 millimeter, less than 1 millimeter, or so, so you are resolving the extra dimension. Then you have to define what is the point which you are on the compact plane. Okay? Then you have to define where you are sitting on the circle. You have to define a point on the circle. This point is clear. So that is the reason why you get this point. Okay? So if you are measuring, um, gravitational potentials at 0.1 mm or 0.0001 mm, you have to define what is the lattice you are looking at, what is the point at which you are measuring your, uh, what is the point you chose, just like you choose x, you have to choose a y 
in the extra dimension and this y is very very small compared to r so that means you have it depends upon where the r is essentially okay where with respect to r you are sitting essentially okay That, that's, it's just a, yeah. So, uh, how can I say y means our okay. Here y is not that y. Uh, the y means uh, our view. Uh, our uh, here the, uh, the lattice point here in where you are measuring the y is an extra dimension uh, point. Okay, in general it's a coordinate that y goes to y to two pi r. That is the size of the extra dimension. But in the extra dimension, I can choose a coordinate where I am sitting. So that means you are sitting at uh, large distances away in the extra dimension, uh, which are uh, heavy, uh, meaning very far from. You cannot resolve the extra dimension. What I mean to say. Okay. Same as this, both the ends are same or they are different here? Uh, maybe I, okay, maybe you read the file, you set the point back. So I should just say that, I will say like this uh, instead of saying that x is much, much larger than r, I just put it in terms of x because y has a definite size essentially. Here, uh, one second, I just answer the question. X. No, this is x is larger than r. This is x is smaller than r. Okay, close to comparable to r. Yeah, you are saying what is these two? These ends are not same. Uh, ah, this end is the same as that number of extra dimensions. This end is the same as number of extra dimensions. X is the four dimensional space. Four dimensional space. No, that is also physical, but it's compact. Rather than say, okay, I should mention it's not y, it should be x. Okay, that means you are resolving very close to here x, but the point is here you should say x and y. Yeah, because the moment you see close to r, you will also have to choose a point in y. Okay, a distance is very close to rather I, I should say some r, some r. Okay, yeah, distance is close to the extra dimension. I will start resolving the extra dimension. So, um, so suppose with this, are, suppose, yeah, sorry, suppose we are working with five dimensions here yeah. in this formula. Imagine some extent of this one point. Yeah. Right, different. So but you will have to choose a point in extra dimension. When you went to third dimension, it should be different from what you have usually in four dimension, which is minus gm by r. This is gm by r. So in four dimension, suppose you do this is gm by r. This is gm by r. But suppose you went to five dimension. No, equation should stay there, right? I mean, summation term is not coming even if you go to five dimension because n is one. N is equal to one, right? But you have to choose a point that there is a y here. Y is there, and there's a and there's an r here. There is an R factor will come into the picture. Even in five dimensions, okay. So one term will come. One term will come. It will be R dependent. It will be R dependent. So this essentially becomes the volume factor. Am I just a number like one two three one two? It's just a lattice. You have to choose one point. So it is like. Uh, uh, y1, y2, y3, y4, y5, y6. So it has to be six directions. So typically, super string inspired, you have six directions. So y1, y2, y3, y4 are the two uh, points at which we are measuring the potential. At which we are measuring the potential. Summing over n or Summing, oh yes, it's summing over n. 
Now this derivation, you can do it actually, it's slightly, uh, uh, there is a very nice paper, I wanted to show you that thing. Ah. This is the paper, I'll put it in the, the same. This is not really, it's a very nice paper. And there is also very nice American Journal of Physics. Okay, uh, this is uh, a very very old paper. Before 1999, before the extra dimensions were even proposed. So this is just American uh, um, Journal of Physics. Okay, there is a nice simple paper called Gauss Law for Non Inverse Square Laws by Landy. Landy. So this is a very nice simple thing. What he does, he does all the volume factors and everything essentially. How to slice this into this thing, okay? And how does the Newton's law change or the Gauss law change if you have extra dimensions? Because the field will change by one by r, extra one by r factor. So if you have large number of length factors, how does it change? And he does the summation. So this is a nice paper essentially. Okay, and this one is by the head years. Yes, and spectros. 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 So this is the paper in which they calculate how the Newton's laws get modified for various sort of compact equations. But various sort of compact equations, how the Newton's law is more. Okay. So, what is the, how do you do the Newton's laws get uh, modified with in the presence of extra dimensions with various compact equations? So now that this is part is settled, uh, so now that the Newton's laws are modified, one can look at what are the Implications. What are the implications for uh, uh, Newton's laws? Essentially, how does this get modified? So now there is this again a review which I'll put it up on this thing. You can look at this review at gravitational measurements in higher dimensions. Okay, gravitational measurements in higher dimensions. So how does things change? Okay, there are several things which change. Okay, uh, so what happens to uh, say, for example, redshift values? Okay, or what happens to just essentially uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, if you have higher dimension black holes? Okay, if you have higher dimension black hole, because this will be very minute, you can have a very small black holes essentially in extra dimension. So, how does this gravitational uh, metric change? How does the potential change? And so, how does, if you have, because Newton's laws also change and everything, you, how does, say, for example, redshift changes around these black holes and uh, various factors? Then, then you have atomic experiments which actually look at uh, close by uh, sub millimeter experiments that you do. Okay? But this paper is completely about redshifts. Dominantly about redshifts. How around a black hole, if there is a higher dimension black hole, it may have the fifth dimension may be compactified. Okay. And in that case, how does if there is light traversing around it, how does it get redshifted essentially? So gravitational lengthening, how does it get modified essentially? Okay. 
So this is a pretty interesting paper I found. It. Okay, this paper is very interesting, and how does it get modified with various dimensions essentially? So, what happens to Hawking gravity uh, evaporation? What happens to Hawking temperature? Okay, and these kind of things are answered. Uh, meaning they did some calculations about this essentially. So deflection of light, redshift, gravitational lensing, gravitational waves. How does these things get modified in the presence of, say, for example, uh, these things, and then this kind of an extra dimension with some compact objects like black holes? Or they will be considered Schwarzschild black holes. Of course, yeah. they change the Okay, and they put some limits on this uh, length of the extra dimensions in meters. So if we have, so their limits are of the order of uh, 2, the length of the extra dimension or r, what we call it r, should be less than or equal to 2 into 10 power minus 18 meters from gravity, purely gravity, not from atomic experiments or something like that, these red ships. Limits, light deflection, so how many mm is this, 10 to the power minus 18 meters means it is below micrometers, okay, nanometers, 10 to the power minus 9 nanometers, so essentially millimeter scale is called completely gone. If you believe in this kind of scenarios, if you believe in these calculations essentially, that you cannot really have large extra dimensions. Okay? You can really cannot really have large extra dimensions. Okay? But they are uh, just using, say, for example, um, um, EDD like models and everything. So, these constraints you should take it with a pinch of salt. Maybe there is some non commutative inside, there is nothing like that. Actually. So you can put, okay. But these limits are pretty strong actually on the size of the extra dimension. Uh, this is, I think, uh, this limit also has uh, a non commutative If you don't have non commutative I think the limit is even weaker. It's not so strong. I tell you the exact limit. This is with non commutativity. Without non commutativity, uh, okay, I'll maybe I shouldn't mention this. Okay, this number is with non commutativity. Uh, without non commutativity, the limit is much weaker essentially. So it's around, the current limits are around uh, 0 0.01 mm. Less than point, but this one I'll tell you essentially once again. Uh, from the gravitational point of view, I thought I saw that number. Dimensions uh, for observers. No, this is from non computer. I missed that part essentially. So this is. Anyway, I'll update these limits. This one is uh, dominant. The strongest constraint comes in this particular case is non-computable, but let's leave this. 
So if I remember correctly, this, this is one of the things. But if you couple matter, now the important point is that you only solve the gravity. You said, okay, I can bring the scale of the gravity from higher depth, from M Planck to all the way up to TV scale by assuming large amount of volume, essentially volume of the order of 0.1 mm, essentially 0.1 mm to 1 mm. Now if you do that and you look, you need minimum of two extra dimensions. Minimum of two extra dimensions are required. Okay. So if you have only one extra dimension, the scale is around 10 power 17 meters. So which will spoil the sun earth distance gravity essentially. Okay. So if you have two extra dimensions, this is around this one. Uh, so two, three, so and so you can have. Now the point is that you brought down the scale of gravity. Now in this model, how are you going to put your standard model speeds? Where are you going to put? How are you going to put standard model speeds? Did I finish all the points? Okay, I wanted to cover quite a few things actually. The first idea was using the idea of, uh, I said there are two main ideas, right, essentially. And they did, one was bringing, using extra volume factor. The second idea was essentially to use localization of formula. So if you have an extra dimensional space, say for example, <coughs> you have this mu and a y here, and this y essentially goes back to itself. So it's some circle. So you normally imagine this to be some sort of a cylinder okay, with the radius r and this is your y and this is longitude and direction is this. So at every space time point you have a circle. Every space time point, okay, you have a circle. Now, what we do, this y has two points, right? y is equal to 0, y is equal to pi m, 2 pi m. y has equal to 0 and y is equal to pi m. So, at one of these points, at one of these points, okay. You localize your four dimension fields. Okay, so that means either at y is equal to pi r because you are not localizing along the extra dimension, but at the end points of the extra dimension, at the end points of the extra dimension, so at the circle, at the cylinder, so that means either here or here you will do something called a three brain. Something called a three brain. Three brain is nothing you can imagine that it's a solid. Something which is localized in space. Not in time. It's a field theory solution which is localized in space. Okay? It is an extended field theory space. Another way is essentially you can think it as a domain model. So, free brain is a solution of string theory. You do not have to worry about this thing. Okay? But in free theory language, it means that there is some sort of a domain wall. 
an extended space okay, uh, which has a solution something like y is equal to 0, delta y is equal to 0, and then next me. Okay, essentially, at delta y is equal to 0, this field sits. Essentially, this space time is localized. All the fields are localized at delta y is equal to 0. Or you choose whatever it is, y is equal to 0. Why I said I keep saying pi r instead of 2 pi r, I'll come to it in a second. So this circle is called circle sphere 1. So this topology is 1. So this is just a domain wall or a localized space. So it's a wave function. It's a solution of the uh, equations. Okay. If you look at the solid terms and instant terms, instant terms, this is localized in x is equal to some x is equal to x mu and at y is equal to zero or y is equal to pi r. Choose one particular point and this is localized there. And this is just a function of x mu. This function is just a function of x mu. Now what you do is, you put all your fields on this particular extended space time. On this particular extended space time. What are the fields we have? We have all the Higgs fields, standard model fields, okay? And you localize all your standard model fields here. especially the Higgs. So this solution, this this entire thing can be thought of as a three frame. Okay? But it's localized only here. It's only localized at one particular point in the extra dimension. So you can think some plane in the extra dimension. So typically you can think this is equal to okay. Before doing that, I'll just tell you what, what happens. I, I'll come to this picture in a second. So the first thing is we had to put fields in extra dimension. Let's try to put a scalar field. So let's write an action for the scalar field. Integral d for five x. Right? That is nothing but d for 4 x dy. Okay. Del mu Higgs del mu C minus dx. Now d is always dimension 1. This 5, so dimension 1, dimension 1, 2, if you take 2 minus 5, 3 by 2. That is the reason the dimension of the Higgs field in 5 dimension is 3 by 2. So the mass dimension of the Higgs field is 3 by 2. Now, what you are saying, this H is a function of x mu and y. Let me do a separation of variables. I will do a separation of variables that it is some x mu and f of y. This function f of y is called profile. Profile of the things in extra dimension.
Now I am saying that it should lie either only at y is equal to 0 or y is equal to pi r. Okay, let me just choose y is equal to pi r. Okay, so that means I f of y is nothing but a delta function y minus pi. So I localize my Higgs on on a brain which is y is equal to pi. So if I have an extra dimension, I have y is equal to pi r. <coughs> and then instead of a cylinder, I'll have something like this. I tell you why I'm getting this thing in one minute essentially. And I first put the Higgs here. Because its profile in the extra dimension is nothing but a delta function. It's nothing but a delta function. I will come to this in a second. Uh, so, keep this in mind. This is your x mu plane. This is your x mu plane localized at y is equal to pi r. <coughs> the next one is to write the action for fermions. Fermions are like the Dirac kinetic term. Okay, integral psi bar i del slash psi minus m. Okay, for let's say Higgs or something. So there are some interaction terms. This is also d for 4x dy. D is only one dimension. So the dimension of psi is what? Tim psi is 2. Dimension of psi is 2. Agree? Everybody agree? Dimension of psi is 2. Now, but there is a bigger problem. There is a bigger problem. Now, this del slash is what? <coughs> del slash is equal to del mu is equal to del mu x plus del y. So, how many gamma matrices I need? I need 5 gamma matrices. 5 independent gamma matrices. Okay? Because for every derivative, I need to add a gamma matrix. So, how do we add in derived equation? So, I for every derivative, del 0, gamma 0. Okay? So, let me call this del slash is with gamma phi, one gamma, gamma matrix, capital gamma. But in phi dimension, there are no phi independent gamma matrices. There are no phi independent gamma matrices. And you cannot define something called gamma phi. In five dimensions, you cannot define chirality. You cannot define chirality. This is the mis proper word because you cannot define gamma phi. How do you define gamma phi? You take gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, gamma, gamma 3. Okay? But you have gamma phi is essentially. So you cannot define gamma phi, so you cannot define chiral fermions. No chiral fermions in five dimensions.
This you can check actually, you can do it yourself. So you start with, so the, uh, the solutions of the Dirac equation, how will you get four dimensions? Uh, four, four components. How will you get four components for the Dirac equation? You write, write the gamma matrices. And the minimum gamma matrices, all you have to do is look for solutions, gamma mu, gamma mu, two eta mu. Okay, now you start with the five dimensional matrix. You take a flat matrix, actually. Okay, then you start with gamma mu, gamma mu is equal to two eta mu mu, but this is pi. Okay, this is pi. Now you look for what are the independent solutions which can give you this, which can satisfy this equation. This has everything, no? Tracelessness of the gamma matrices, this has determinants, of positivity, everything it has. This one equation will have everything. Okay? All the information it has. Now, if you see that, if you don't have, I uh, mean, you have eight dimensional, you only have four independent gamma matrices, and they are eight dimensional. They are eight dimensional. Okay? So if you see these solutions of this equation essentially, <coughs> what are the number of components you need? Just like here, alpha and beta matrices, we needed four, four dimensional matrices to satisfy this equation. Here you need eight dimensional matrices and only four of them are independent. Eight dimensional matrices. How many equations are there? Five equations. There are five, five now essentially. You, you can write traces, and, okay. This is five dimensional matrix, okay. It's a five by five matrix essentially. So these are five gamma matrices 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, okay. So they are not independent. So you can only have gamma matrices. So the, uh, five will exhaust all possible independence. So you cannot write another chiral gamma matrix. The product of that is no longer an independent product essentially. In five dimensions. This you can check essentially. You can do it yourself. Is it P4 or P4 as it was? Pardon? P4 as it was. P4 as it was. No, P4 as it was. This is all P4 as it was. Or if you want to look at, you can look at uh, <coughs> derivation of spinors in n dimensional uh, dimension space, you can look at uh, Polchinski's uh, appendix, volume 1. Polchinski's appendix has it. Okay. Or, there is actually a very thin book called Spinal, I forgot its name, Gamma Matrix, a very thin book, I think it's written by. The guy's name comes with F. Very thin book on spinors in n dimension. Very thin book. It's very good. Okay, I forgot. I don't know. In earlier days, we used to go to library to find all these things. Nowadays, we don't have library, so we don't know. Okay. Yeah, I forgot the name. I think it's Freund, I think. Freund or something like that. So you cannot have chirality. So people started looking how to introduce chirality in five dimensions. How to introduce chirality in five dimensions. So the way to introduce chirality in five dimensions is to this five dimension space which is in shape of a circle <coughs> you introduce you mod this space you mod this space or if you want you identify every point in this space with an identification y is equal to minus 1. y is equal to minus 1. This is a, nothing but a z2 symmetry. Okay? So this topology is called S1 by Z2. So if y is equal to minus 1, what happens? Because this is a unit circle, this is 0. Every point here gets identified. Every point here gets identified. 
every point k this side is equal to every point k this side is equal to every point k this side every point k this entire circle becomes just a line okay you have an additional condition it's not only periodic condition which we have okay you also have put a national condition y is equal to minus one this is called or b for you this was again discovered in string theory it's called or b for you so what does or b for you do it leads to two points y is equal to zero and y is equal to pi r where you can have just four dimensional formula Ordinary four dimensional functions and then at the end points. So these two points, y is equal to zero and y is equal to pi r, you can have ordinary four dimensional formulas. Chiral formulas. You can have chiral formulas. So these end points have become a line like this. Y is equal to zero and y is equal to pi r. And now I can define my chiral formulas. My formulas here. At singular point, these are also called singular points. At singular points or end points, four D, five D fermions is equal to is equal to four D fermions. So at these points, you can actually use four D fermions, four D Dirac equation. Again, now it has psi of x mu y is equal to psi of x mu and f of y, and this f of y is equal to delta y minus y. So you can localize them. So doing this, you have a solution for the chiral. So this idea one. Any questions, Bridges? What? So what it does, the orbit folding, it reduces the gamma matrices because y is equal to minus y. It reduces the gamma matrix dimension from eight dimensions to four dimensions. Okay, y is equal to minus y. That's the condition. So the moment you put y is equal to minus y, it reduces the dimension back to four dimensions. So you can use ordinary four dimensional gamma matrices at those singular points. Only at y is equal to zero and y is equal to pi. Okay. At those singular points, you can just reduce it to four dimensions because of the Z2 symmetry. So, in addition to the gamma symmetry, you have an additional Z2 symmetry which will connect y to minus one. So, it's like reducing the number of degrees of freedom by half. Okay. So, with this, we have the second solution. Or the solution for the hierarchy problem, which is nothing but the ADD model. Dimensions with R much much uh, 
around the scale of 0 0.1 and then at least two. Have this kind of extra space and dimension, reducing the plant scale to P. The second point is that fermions, pigs, fermion. Gauge boson are confined to a three plane or a domain wall at a singular point. of the compact space <coughs> S1 by S0. Why they are called singular points? Y is equal to 2 pi r and y is equal to minus, minus y. At y is equal to 0, the solution breaks down because 0 is equal to minus 0 and y is equal to 2 pi r the same thing happens. That is the reason why they are called singular points. These are two places where it breaks down. The two conditions will break down essentially. 0 is equal to minus 0 or you have 2 pi r is equal to minus 2 pi r. But not minus y is equal to minus y. So 2 pi r is equal to minus y. So these are called singular points. At a singular point. So you have here, all the forces, SM particles, forces, but gravity, this is x mu and this is extra dimension, so this is y is equal to pi r, y is equal to 0, but gravity Lives in five dimensions, five, six, or more dimensions. Gravity lives in six or more dimensions. Okay. So now you look at the solution for the hierarchy problem. What did we say? The hierarchy problem. If you write an effective field theory. It will pick up the highest mass scale in the which is nothing but the Planck mass scale. Now, if you write an effective field theory, what is the highest mass scale? It is Te and star. So, the highest mass scale essentially because the reduced Planck scale is the highest mass scale. So, it is M star. If you write an effective field theory, so it is effective. So, in which case, mu square goes to highest mass scale. So you are reducing your hierarchy problem by bringing something in. So what, what does it give you? It gives you gravitons. Okay? It gives you gravitons in extra space time dimension. So, so all these particles will interact with gravitons. All these particles will interact with gravitons. Standard model particles and everything will interact with gravitons. And they can be produced copiously. They can be produced copiously. So maybe I'll do the graviton spectrum next week, and uh, then I'll do the localization uh, of the fermions. Okay. This is the first model uh, of the. Thing. How do they interact? Okay, I'll just give the outline. I'll do the derivation. Essentially. So suppose. <coughs> This is thing. So, what are the consequences of this? So, I just 
the upper right hand corner. Let's grab the action is what? Okay, is G dead G or root G R. Okay, and plan. If we just take the gravitation action. This is just what it is. Now, how does this get modified? How does this get modified? This is called the Einstein free word action. From this, you get your Einstein free word Okay, we minimize this. But M Planck square has to be replaced by replaced with. M star square, M star square, R square, okay. R power M. Okay, so this gives me M plan two M plus M two pi R power M. Now, if it's just pure gravity, I don't mind. But then, how does gravity interact with ordinary uh, particles? What is the matter coupling of gravity? Will you square it? No, how do all the matter coupled with gravity? What is the what is it? what is the action? This you have done. I think plus studied in Mukno. Anybody? What does it gravity couple with to matter? Here it is. I, I saw the okay. I'll show you this figures. Meanwhile, this is the figure. Okay, the present day Cavendish experiments and Casimir force experiments. So, this is the attraction constant alpha. Essentially, this is interaction range. So what is important is this one essentially. What is the thing which is ruled out? Meaning what are the present limits? The present limits are sitting here. So at the range 10 power minus 1, 10 power minus 2, 10 power minus 3. Okay. In terms of uh, 10 power minus 4. So this is around 1 millimeter if you want a limit. Okay. 0.1 millimeter this is what this is all excluded by exponents all this region white region is excluded by exponents and this is the only thing which is allowed okay so you see that this is going below below 10 power minus 3 10 power minus 1 so it's reaching 0.1 millimeter essentially 0.1 millimeter and from this is from laboratory exponents this is 
again, but uh, this is uh, in the long range astrophysical experiments. La long range astrophysical experiments, but this is for one extra dimension. But if you have two extra dimensions, this becomes complicated. So what extra dimensions do is, uh, uh, okay, uh, what extra dimensions do is they modify the Newton's law. They give you a Yukawa-like potential to the Newton's potential. They give you an extra Yukawa-like term. So the Newton's law, Newton's gravitation potential is modified by Newton's 1 by r potential plus an e power minus mu r potential. This alpha r essentially. E power minus alpha r. So what you are measuring this interaction strength is this alpha. Okay. What you are calling as the interaction strength is this alpha. Alpha is this new uh, meaning coming due to the modification of the extra dimension. Oh, I, this is where it is. Well, okay. I thought it is there in other one. Minute. So, if you want, uh, so for various things, I'll just show you some examples how the potential looks like. So this is like a Yukawa potential, no? E power x by e power minus x by x is like a Yukawa potential essentially. Yukawa potential with that this is mean maybe this is the nuclear length sort of thing. Okay. Typically we take this to be a one per mu or something. So here it is 0.1. So this is like it gives you a correction like a Yukawa like potential correction to the gravitational potential, all divided by one layer. So this is if this is d is equal to 0, there is nothing. Okay. If d is non zero, you will get this extra potential. Now, if you um, if you have more complicated modification, we will come to that essentially. Uh, you will have some exponent, uh, modification of this one. Okay. You will have some k factors and everything essentially. Okay. I, in that paper of Kahedia and everybody. So this is what you measure the deviations essentially. This is what you measure for the deviations from the classic potential at various distances. What are the sources they use in this paper like for the astrophysical experiments? Astrophysical, I think uh, uh, okay. Uh, the dominant comes actually from neutron star school uh, meaning supernova cooling and so on so. So I'll come to that when I write the gravitational potential. Meaning, because gravitons are these massless particles which are millions of them because they are coupled non-gravity. They couple through energy momentum tensor. We will do it next. So they are coupled to energy momentum tensor, and you take the weak gravity limit. Okay, R mu is called H mu. Okay, and this H mu will have different modes, several modes. All of them will couple to the standard model to the T mu. They couple to the T mu. So the coupling is essentially T mu nu H mu nu. T mu nu H mu nu. H mu nu is the graviton field. So these millions of gravitons will couple to all the fermions and all the standard model particles. So the dominant uh, uh, constraint coming from astrophysics is neutron star cooling. And not neutron star cooling, supernova cooling. I'm sorry. Supernova cooling, sun's effects, and so on and so forth. Okay. And we will do that uh, in the next class. Next class is Okay. So we let's T me new R me new. 
So R mu nu, we just take it to be H mu nu, or G mu nu, or H mu. Okay. H mu nu. Okay. We couple it with a decoupling limit. Okay. So G mu nu is equal to eta mu nu plus H mu nu. We make this big gravity limit essentially, and then we end up having the coupling like this. So can this like modify the, this potential can extend the gravitational effects of the uh, matter? Can they if this modification is at a very very small scale? Mm -hmm. But to that matter we need at a very large scale, cluster scale. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the reason why you need to modify it at a different scale. The Wilgrom's I think is different scale. Clusters and galaxy scales. Here you are modifying it at scales which are 0.1 mm or something. Like that. So you don't really kind of explain that. But you can, yeah, as you will see, you have some counterpart called lightest colorable particle which can act like that. But the modification of the Newton's law will not satisfy, uh, will not give you the same modification as required by. Uh, Milgram's uh, modification. This is at a much, much very low scale, essentially. Length scales compared to what is required. There you need the modification at very large scales. So this is the complete opposite. You are modifying gravity at very short scales. So modification at very large scales also should not modify the conditions. Right. It should not modify. Like for example, uh, that's the reason Milgram's thing is in a, uh, in, is in uh, uh, some sort of a tension with, uh, say, for example, observations from bullet cluster and so on. So, otherwise, you can fit all the galaxy data with Milgram's thing. Maybe a modification of large uh, gravitational thing uh, because at a galaxy scale. Because galaxy scale means it's beyond solar system and so on. Mm -hmm. It's a very very large scale. You are changing it around parts, mm -hmm. 120 parts, 20 kiloparts, 100 parts, or something like that. At that level, you are changing the Newton's gravity. But even at that level, even you can modify, when you look at two clusters colliding with each other, you can measure the gravitational potential exactly like what you do with gravitational lensing. You can measure the gravitational potential and you can map the gravitational potential and you see that the gravitational potential does not get modified from the Newton check. But the visible thing is different. The visible thing is very close there and the gravitation potential, invisible gravitation potential is not modified by the Newton. So that is, uh, in that Milgram cannot explain <coughs> the gravitation potential uh, which is observed by bullet cluster. A Milgram, a Milgram's uh, prescription cannot explain the blood cluster, if you remember the figure, the gravitational potential is two large blobs essentially, whereas the visible is essentially like this you know, infrared data space. And, and the dark energy is at a much, even much weaker scale. Okay, and that means at even low energy, that means at even at larger scales. So that is really not beyond cluster scale. So you need to modify gravity if you want to explain it at energies around EB. Uh, electron, uh, not even EB, milli electron volts. Ten power minus three, ten power minus two. Here you are modifying a T. Okay. But there, 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 there you are modifying at EB. That means really universe size. The entire universe size you are modifying. Uh, there. Uh, for the dark energy, um, yeah, there are models with extra energy. There are some models with extra energy. There is one particular model called DGT model, which is in extra energy. Okay, so that is, that doesn't come from extra energy. Mond doesn't come from extra energy. Mond doesn't come from extra energy. 
because uh, exponentially it's not possible. You don't need a quantum theory to explain. So, yeah, any questions? Are you you're still unhappy with the gospel? Or? <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Other things which are bothering you now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's more. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And this is exactly like electrostatics, right? except that the gravitation field is exactly like in electrostatics. Uh, and uh, uh, matrix, you just take G to be per unit uh, mass, essentially. So that your, your force per unit mass or force per unit uh, charge. Or whatever, yeah. Just modify So, what are the things which is bothering you? <laughs> no. I got the main idea. The mathematics, uh, gamma matrices is the only thing. No? The only new thing which I did today was the gamma matrices. Mm -hmm. Other things are 